is there a weight that Griffin and Sabine, you're now carrying Griffin and Sabine, like are you starting to, to loathe them the way Sherlock Holmes was the bane of Arthur Conan Doyle's I mean, existence? Like, like Eric Burden having to sing The House of the Rising Sun. Every, yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, what your yeah. sentence in hell is. Um, no, not, not quite yet. We shall see. Uh, m- my involvement now is minimal. Um, Mostly because, um, I mean, there's the Venetian's wife, and since then I've actually just completed another book, The Forgetting Room. So really, Griffin and Sabine is about three or four back. So it's almost as though the voices, the voices that I tapped into to write the books, are ancient history. So I look on the whole book almost as though somebody else did it. Let's talk about um, the Venetian's wife. And the subtitle on the front of the book is A Strangely Sensual Tale of a Renaissance Explorer, a Computer, and a Metamorphosis. And I looked at it and went, yeah, right. And um, damn you, it is. And, and, and sensual is, is the perfect word for it. This is a very sexy book without having sex in it necessarily. Uh, it's very nice to hear that because that's exactly what I wanted it to be. Um, yeah. I find that our, when I say our, I mean society as a whole, has done something to sensuality. It has taken it down a certain path, and the path seems to run sensuality, erotica, pornography. And my feeling is it should go back the other way up the path, and it should go sensuality, um, warmth, spirituality that it should be um, a thing that makes you um, closer to the universe, not separated inside yourself from feeling slightly tacky, or very tacky, depending how far down the road you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to do a book that, that touched on different attitudes towards um, uh, a sensual awakening. And this this is my my struggle something about reading your books reminds me of um, being in a cave in France looking at cave drawings <laughs> the, like the Lascaux cave drawings yes yeah I, I would like to I understand what you mean by that it's, it's almost as though you've unearthed something that's already there uh, Doris Lessing she, when she talks about writing she says um it's really uncovering what's already on the page. Um, Michelangelo's reference to releasing the figures out of the stone. For me, the creative process is very much that. But it's not, uh, it's not a horribly sort of intense experience. I mean, it's play. I mean, it's, as, as Jung said, I mean, there's no real creativity without play. So you, I, you know, I go in the studio and I play. And stuff comes out and then I step back and I say okay this works this doesn't work this needs to go over here this and then I go back into the play mode it's even within painting because that's basically what I was originally a painter uh, the process I learned very early on was order and chaos you create a bit of chaos down on your your surface your canvas your board whatever you're working on then you bring some order to it but you don't keep on bringing order because the, you then step back and say, okay, I'm going to keep that bit and that bit and that bit, but that bit, I'm going to chuck in a load more chaos. So you just slap a bit of paint around or scrub it in or whatever you do, and then you start ordering it. And gradually you build the picture out of alternate price. So it stays alive. And if, for me, the process of, of building a book is exactly that, is trying to keep it alive all the time, not having it die on you before you get to the end. If you had to personally stock your book in a bookstore, what, what section would it, would it go under? I mean... Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, well, the, last, the latest book, um, I didn't want to put a novel on it. I, what I put on it was a fiction. And I think that's what I do. I do, I do fiction. So it definitely appears in the fiction category. In a way, they're, they're forgeries. Um, they're forgeries in the sense that... Um, a very interesting way of bringing people in to believing something is if you begin with a very serious face and you're wearing a white coat and you start talking about very serious things in a very straightforward way then people go along with that but then after a while 
you find a very reasonable and sensible way of talking about magic carpets. And then from there, you talk about the way you can look into the pattern of the magic carpet. And gradually, you justify the existence of um, magic, and you take people into another world. So by the time they've crossed over that boundary between the reasonable and the unreasonable, they're already hooked. So what are my books? They're, I mean, they're, yes, they are fictions. They're not full novels. I mean, I'm not trying to write a 250-page novel in um, 75 pages of text and 50 pages of, of images. Um, I guess if we're going to talk in that term of analogy, they're more novellas or even expanded short stories. But that would be just taking the text alone. I mean, for me, they're just a different genre. They're, and where should they go on the shelves in bookstores? I just like seeing them piled up on the desk at the front. And disappearing quickly, probably. Yes, yes. <laughs> the book is The Venetian's Wife, a strangely sensual tale of a Renaissance explorer, a computer, and a metamorphosis. And I've been speaking with the author and also the author of the uh, Griffin and Sabine trilogy, Nick Bantock. And The Venetian's Wife is published by Raincoast Books.